Hello, I just wanted to come to you for a few moments today just to kind of share with you something that the Lord has been blessing me with. Uh, I've been looking at the book of Ephesians um, chapter 1, and God has really been dealing with me on this chapter, and I've really dug in deep to see what the Word of God wanted me to 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 see for myself, and, and I pray today that what God has given me will be a blessing to you. Um, I don't know about you, but it's cold here in Kentucky. It's it's uh, we got sleet out on the ground, and uh, it's warm inside though. And I thank God for the warm house, and I uh, uh, pray that you are finding yourself in a warm place today as well. Um, but I do want to take the opportunity to come to you and look at the Book of Ephesians, chapter one. Pray that God will bless you the way He's been blessing me through this through this chapter. Um, and so let's just uh, let's just dig right into this if we could. I I, I want to start by just giving you some information here. Paul the apostle he's he's writing this letter from from a Roman prison um, as we find in the book of Acts chapter twenty eight. Uh, we can even find it here in the book of Ephesians chapter three and in chapter six as well. Um, Paul's future is really is is uncertain at this time uh he, he's not sure what may happen with him yet this letter expresses uh, paul's confidence his great confidence in god and, and 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 as we look at this we find that paul as he's writing here he says in the very first verse he says these words he says paul an apostle of jesus christ by the will of god to the saints who are in ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Paul is an apostle of Jesus Christ, and that's what he states here in this letter. And being an apostle of Christ, he speaks with authority. He speaks, um, and when he speaks, people listen. You know, uh, maybe you've got somebody in your life, you know, they when they speak, I better listen. I better hear what what they're saying. I better heed the words that they're giving me. Well, Paul's that way, and 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 he's writing this letter to the church of Ephesus, and he's speaking uh, with authority. In Galatians one one, the Bible says that that Paul an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. It, it shares once again about Paul's apostleship and, and, and how that he has the authority of Jesus Christ to speak the word uh, that he is speaking. Paul's message is a message that can be trusted because it's a message that came from Jesus Christ and, and is, is foundational for the church. If you Look with me over in the book of Ephesians chapter number 2. You find in verses, I believe, 19 and, and verse 20, where the Bible says these words, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Verse 20 says, Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Okay, so Paul knows that what he's doing is the will of God. He knows that he's been called by God to do this. He's been called by God to preach the gospel, to be an apostle of Christ, and to, to use this authority in the name of Jesus. Uh, Paul, as we read this passage of scripture in Ephesians 1, we find that, that, that Paul greets them uh, in verse 2 with, with a, a blessing, a, a gospel blessing. He says, uh, grace and peace. As a matter of fact, uh, he's, he, he says this in, in, in verse number two. He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, uh, in saying these two words, he is summarizing the salvation that we receive in Christ. Okay, uh, Paul describes our salvation. And as he describes our salvation, Paul seeks to stretch our minds, you know, Paul was good at that. He wanted to stretch our minds. He wanted us to think a little bit. He wanted us to to uh, use our minds, to wrap our minds around what he's saying in his word. But yet they, he, Paul's writings were so simple that, that you didn't have to be an educated person to really uh, understand what he was saying because he wanted, he wanted the gospel to be that way. Okay, Paul here says three things that I want to show you about salvation. Salvation is far richer than you think. It, it, it is the eternal purpose of the triune God. Let me show you what I'm saying. 
If you look at verses 4 through verse 6, it reads like this. It says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Uh, verse number six reads like this, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Okay, it, it, it is it is planned and administered by the Father. Salvation is planned and, and administered by God the Father. If you go on and you read verses 7 through 12, you find that it is purchased and it is accomplished by the Son. And then if you read verses 13 and 14, it's applied and it is communicated by the Holy Spirit. So we see in <coughs> excuse me in verses 4 through 14 how the, the triune Godhead is used in the salvation process. You have the Father who, who planned and administered, the Son who purchased and accomplished, and then you have the Holy Spirit who applied and communicated. Salvation is originated in eternity, as I read in verse number four, and, and it stretches forward to a future time. Uh, when all things will be united under the rule of King Jesus, as, as verse 10 states here, which says these words. Verse 10 says that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him, in Christ. You can also go and look at verse 14 which reads like this, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Okay, so salvation is originated in eternity and it stretches forward to a future time when we'll be united under the rulership of King Jesus. Um, salvation is far bigger than, than, than our minds can comprehend. If you look at verses 9 and 10 of Ephesians 1, the Bible reads like this. It says, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. Okay, so the source of our blessing is found in verse number three. The source of our blessing is found in verse number three, which states like this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Our source is found right here. These blessings that's mentioned here are secure because they are in the heavenly realm. They're in the heavenly places, okay? Heavenly places. Uh, Paul has reminded us that the plan of salvation was initiated by the fathers. We read in verses 4 through 6. God the Father, I want you to hear, if you don't hear anything else, hear this. God the Father does not love us because Christ died for us. No, Christ died for us because God the Father loved us. Let me show you what I'm saying. John 3, 16, something that we all know. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But what about 1 John chapter 4, and verse 10, which reads, In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation of, for our sins. God did this freely and without compulsion. He sent Christ to this earth to die on the cross so that you and I, could have life through what Christ did for us at Calvary, through the blood that he shed, through the atoning sacrifice that he made. Friend, I'm here to tell you, salvation is real. Salvation is real, and it's for you, and it's for me. It's for those around us. Jesus Christ loved us. You know, he could have called a multitude of angels, but he didn't. Why? Because his love for you and me kept him upon that cross. It wasn't the nails. It wasn't the, the Roman soldiers and, and the things that they were doing to him, the beatings that they were giving. No, friend, what kept him on that cross? What kept him uh, going from, from the Garden of Gethsemane to uh, standing before Pilate to being uh, beaten uh, and bruised and battered all the way to being nailed on the cross? What kept him there was his love for us. 
He knew that God loved us so much that he sent Christ to accomplish this task, to be the atoning sacrifice. And through the blood that Jesus shed on Calvary, you and I, we find, we find life, we find it more abundantly. If you don't know Jesus Christ, I encourage you to find a place and to ask him to forgive you of your sin, repent of your sin, tell him I am in need of you. I long to be saved. I, 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 I need you. Repent of your sins. Ask him into your heart. I'm here to tell you, he'll bless your soul. He'll come in and he'll, he will bless you and he'll make you feel uh, better than you've ever felt. I promise you that because Christ loves you just as God loves you. And we see this, that he did, you know, God freely gave of his son. He freely gave of his son. As a matter of fact, if you look at verse five in Ephesians chapter one, the Bible reads like this. Paul, in his writing, says, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, of his will. You know, in verses 7 through 12, Paul begins to describe the way that Christ has won all these blessings for us. He begins to, to, to show us how Christ has won these blessings for us and how, how they apply to our life. Uh, the thing that we need to remember here is that Jesus Christ is the focal point. He is the focal point. What Christ did for us at the cross, that is the focal point. And we, we, we never get away from that. Uh, these these guys who may lead you to believe something else, don't follow that because there's only one way into heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ and him crucified. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No man comes to the Father except by me. And I'm here to tell you this this evening, I'm here to tell you that, that that's the only way into heaven is through the blood that Jesus shed. And, and so he has to be uh, the center of it all. You know, everything works through the perimeters of what Christ did at Calvary. Even the Holy Spirit will work through the perimeters of, of Christ and him crucified. And, and, and that's something that you need to understand and, and need to, to really uh, hold to as you walk this Christian journey, as you uh, live this Christian life out. Everything the Father planned and the Son purchased for us, it's been applied to us by the Holy Spirit. If you look in Ephesians chapter 1 and you look at verses 13 and 14, Scripture reads, In whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Now, Paul, in, in, in writing these two verses, he uses two metaphors to help understand the work of Holy Spirit. The first one that he uses is in verse 13, and he describes the Spirit as a seal. Now, when I think of a seal, I'm not talking about the animal that, that, that we might be thinking of right now. No, I'm talking about a seal. And when I think about this, I think about, I like Westerns. Uh, some of you may or may not, but I like Westerns. And and one of the things that that I'm I, I immediately my mind goes to is how that a ranch a rancher would would if he's got a bunch of cattle he'll he'll brand them he'll put his stamp on them and what it's doing he, he's sealing them he's letting people know this cow belongs to me or, or or this horse belongs to me or whatever the case might be he's letting them know this is mine through the seal that he places on that on that animal. Now, I'm not saying that we're animals. Please don't misunderstand me. But I use that as an example because when something is sealed, it's marked with the owner's name and it's secured as being his or her possession, such as the horse or the, the cattle, etc., etc. God marks believers. He marks you and I as his very own by sending his Holy Spirit to live within us. You know, the Spirit's presence reminds us that we belong to God. When we, when we get into the Spirit, it reminds us that I belong to God. I have the blood of Jesus Christ flowing through my veins. And the Bible says that we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, that we're a peculiar people. How can we be a, a peculiar people, which means God's own special people? How can we be that? Through what Christ did at the cross and through walking in the presence of Holy Spirit. That's how. That's how. So, so, so the first thing he describes the spirit as is he he's, he uses the the metaphor as a seal, 
And as a matter of fact, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 22 reads, Who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Now, the second thing that we find is the Spirit is a pledge. Verse 14. Uh, the word pledge is a Greek word, which means the payment of part of a purchase price in advance. Now, when my mind thinks of this, I simply think of a down payment. You know, when you go to purchase that vehicle, you they want to know how much you're putting down. And, and you put down a certain amount of money. It's a down payment. It's, it's showing them that I'm going to purchase this vehicle because I'm putting X amount of dollars down on it up front. The Holy Spirit is a down payment. I want you to grasp this this more or this evening. Second Corinthians five five, Paul writes these words. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. See, when we begin to experience the Spirit's work in our lives, when we begin to experience his presence in our lives, it's a foretaste of heaven itself. You begin to experience God and you begin to experience the power of the Holy Spirit flowing through your veins. It's, it's, it's like heaven. Friend, I'm here to tell you, I'm not saying that everything that, that life throws your way is going to be a piece of cake. There's going to be tests and trials. But when you have Christ in your heart and the Spirit of God flowing through your veins and you know who you are in Him, then you can make it. You can make it to the very end, and, and and that's what I want you to understand here, is that when we begin to experience the Spirit's work in our lives, it's a foretaste of heaven itself. God, here's what I want you to, to understand. God is our inheritance. He is. Look what First Peter 1, verse 3 through 5 reads. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And in verse 4 it says, To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. And in verse 5 he says, Who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So God is our inheritance. But not only that, we are his inheritance. We're his inheritance. Uh, if you go to the book of Isaiah, and, and I, I really didn't have this in my uh, notes, but if you go to the book of Isaiah and you look at chapter 43, I'll turn there real quickly. Isaiah chapter 43. Here's what he says in the first five verses. If you'll give me just a moment. Here's what he says. He says, But now thus saith the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. God said, you are mine. Praise the Lord. Can I tell you today that you are God? If you have Christ in your heart, you belong to God. Amen. He says in verse 2, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your salvation. I gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba for, uh, in your place. Since you were precious in my sight, you have been honored and I have loved you. Therefore, I will give men for you and people for your life. And in verse 5, here's what he says. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the east and gather you from the west. So this lets me know right here that not only do not only do uh, do I belong to God, but God belongs to me. And what I mean by that is this. I, I, I belong to God. And through the love that he has for me and the blood that Christ shed on the cross for me, when I receive him, I belong to him, but he also he, he also belongs to me. Jesus said that if, if I abide in him, then he abides in me. Amen. Uh, the spirit, what the spirit does is he makes us homesick for heaven as we long to enter into his inheritance or into this inheritance, should I say. We have an inheritance. You know, when I think of an inheritance, I think of somebody who leaves you something uh, when when they pass on. And, and, and a lot of times, you know, it, it may be a lump sum of money. Or it may be a home. It may be a piece of land or whatever it might be. It's an inheritance. And an inheritance is something that was 
passed from one person to another. It's something that's given to you. We, we have an inheritance. And the inheritance is the fact that God loved us, sent his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross. And through the blood that he shed, if we come to know him by faith, then he will bless us with an inheritance that far exceeds anything this world has to offer us. Now, if you look here in Ephesians chapter 1, what you find is this. You find that in verse 15, Paul begins to pray. And he begins to pray for the church of Ephesus, the saints that are in Ephesus. And as Paul sits in prison, as you remember, he's in a Roman prison. He's being encouraged by what he's hearing about the church of Ephesus. And, and, and he realizes that God is at work among the church in Ephesus. And so Paul begins to pray. In verse 16, you find that Paul's prayer is persistent and it's thankful. Here, here's what Paul, here's what Paul says in verse number, in verse number 16. Paul said, Do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Paul's telling him, I don't stop praying for you. I consistently pray for you. I'm encouraged about what I'm hearing. I thank God that, that, that you have grasped hold of this, that I preached to you, which was Christ and him crucified. And I'm so grateful that you're taking this message and you are continuing to spread the gospel, even though I'm not there. Paul's excited about this. He is encouraged about this. And so he goes to prayer. And, and, and we come, as we look at this prayer, we come to to the substance of Paul's prayer, which is found in verses 17 down through verse 23. Uh, Paul, it's the substance of his prayer. He, he It consists of three requests that Paul makes. The first request is in verse 17. And he says this in verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. So, the first thing we see is a deeper knowledge of God. Paul said, I want them to have a deeper knowledge of God. All of us should want a deeper knowledge of God. Lord, show me who you are. Reveal to me what it is you want me to see in the word. I want a deeper walk with you, a deeper knowledge of who you are. And, as, and that's what Paul's praying for the church of Ephesus. And the second thing is found in verse 18, which says, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? So the second thing that he's asking uh, God to do is he's, he's asking for a fuller grasp of their hope. Give them a fuller grasp of their hope. Let them know that there's hope and, 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 and an inheritance that you've prepared for them, God. So Paul's wanting them to grasp this. He's wanting to see the hope that they have in Christ and the inheritance that they have in God. And then the third thing that he prays is found in verses 19 through 23, which says these words. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the work of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power, might and dominion in every name that is named not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. Verse 22. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So the third thing that Paul wants uh, is praying for and, and wants God to do, he, he, wants, he wants the church of Ephesus to have a knowledge of him. He wants the church of es Ephesus to grasp the hope and the inheritance that they have in God. And then he wants them to know the greatness of God's power exercised in and for those who believe. That's what he's asking God to do. Show them your power, God. I'm telling you, we're living in a day and time where we need the power of God to move. We need the power of God to move today. Paul uses four different Greek words in verse 19. There's four things that he uses to describe God's power toward his people. Uh, they can be translated as these four things. Number one is dynamic. God is dynamic. Number two, energetic. Number three, mighty. And then number four is strong. God, he uses these four things, these four different Greek words to describe his power. It's dynamic, it's energetic, it's mighty, and it is strong. It is strong. See, God's mighty power is anchored in heaven itself. Amen.
And since the Lord not only raised Christ from the dead, but took him bodily into heaven, and he seated Christ at his right hand. You know, Christ didn't remain in the tomb. But on the third day, he arose from the grave, praise the Lord. And, and, and he ascended to heaven. And when he went to heaven, he sat down at the right hand of the Father. It shows a plate. What this does is it shows a place of authority and it shows a place of power. Jesus Christ has authority and he has power. And if Christ lives inside of you, you have the power of Christ flowing through your veins and the authority of Christ flowing through your veins. So when the enemy comes at you, you don't have to tolerate his nonsense, but you can let him know I'm a child of God. I've been washed in the blood of the lamb. I'm on my way to heaven and the power that resides in Jesus Christ resides in me. Devil, I command you in Jesus name to get out of my way. Friend, I'm going to tell you, you got that power and that authority through Jesus Christ. You do. If you look at verses 20 through 22, which I'll read again, it says this, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality, power, and might, and dominion in every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. That's talking about not only in Paul's day, but forever. He said here in verse 22, and he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. And verse 23 says, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Ephesus, what you what I want you to see is that Ephesus was a it was a city that was steeped in witchcraft. They were big into witchcraft. And Paul is reminding the, the saints at Ephesus, he's reminding them that Jesus Christ is Lord over all things, over occult powers. He's, he's, he's a, he, Jesus Christ it has more authority over, over any of these things. He's over them all. Christ, God has given him all power and all authority. There is nothing that can stop the move of God. There is nothing that... Satan had his best shot when he put Christ, you know, when, when Jesus was nailed to the cross. He thought he won the fight, but it was only the beginning because on the third day, Jesus Christ arose from the grave. And during that time period that he was in the tomb, as many have stated, he went to hell. And I don't believe he just knocked on the door, but I believe he busted the door wide open. And he said, devil, I'm here to collect what's mine. Give me the keys of death, hell, and the grave. He took authority. You know why? Because he's the king of kings and he is the Lord of lords. I want to tell you, Ephesus, it's a, it was steeped in witchcraft, but it was no power for God. And, and the things that we face in this world today, they're no match for God. They're no match for God. All power, all authority are now Jesus Christ's. They're his. They're at his command. And he reigns over all things. He reigns over all. I, I, I want to close by saying this. Because of Christ's great power, there's no sinner that is beyond rescue. I'm going to say it again. Because of Christ's great power, there is no sinner that is beyond rescue. And there's no saint, which is a child of God, that's beyond recovery. I don't know where you find yourself today. I don't know what you find yourself in. Maybe you're going through a test or a trial and you say to yourself, how can I keep going in this? Uh, God, what what have I done wrong? Or maybe maybe you're, you're, you're lost and you don't know Christ as your Savior and you're saying, man, this is... This is not worth living. Life life is horrible, and, and everything that I go at messes up. I want to tell you the answer is Jesus Christ. Paul is pointing us here in the very first chapter of, of Ephesians. He is pointing us to Christ. He is pointing us to the one who came to this earth, died on the cross, so that we could have life and have it more abundantly. He came to this cross, and he, or this world, and died on the cross, for you and me, because God loved us. I want you to know this morning or this evening, I want you to know that God loves you. And wherever you find yourself, God's right there. All you have to do is talk to him as you would talk to me or anybody else. Talk to him today. 
Let him know that you you're sorry. Let him know that you 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 want him to take the will. You want him to be in control of your life. You want to walk in the spirit. You want to 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 experience the life that a child of God should experience. I challenge you with this today. And hey, listen, if this blesses you, do me a favor. Click the subscribe button on our YouTube channel. Like this. Share this. Let others know. And we look forward to it. Uh, we pray for you daily. We pray that God's blessings be upon you. Um, and that you come back and be with us again next time. And until then, just know we love you and we're praying for you. God bless.